Broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupin. Welcome to the show. My name is John. Before we get going, I have a couple of notes. First, the sound may be a little different because I'm recording in a hotel in Fort Worth where I'm attending the podcast movement. And secondly, since it is August and everyone is heading back to school, I wanted to spend this month reviewing school movies. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links in the show notes to various social medias. I will kick this month's school film off with a movie in which the male lead won the Oscar over Clark Gable as Rhett Butler and the lead female lost the Oscar to Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara. The movie, of course, is Goodbye Mr. Chips, 1939. By the way, he also won over Lawrence Olivier for Wuthering Heights, James Stewart for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and Mickey Rooney for Babes in Arms. The man who won the Oscar for Best Male Actor during this magical year is English actor Robert Donnett. Donnett played the title role, Mr. Chips or Chipping. Robert Donnett was a mellow-sounding English actor. Donnett was born in 1905 and was in his first Shakespeare production by the age of 16. He began traveling with his theater group and acted all over Britain. Alexander Corden noticed Donnett's acting chops and gave him a three-year film contract. During this time, Donitz was cast as Thomas Culpepper in The Private Lives of Henry VIII, 1933. Donitz went to Hollywood to work on The Count of Monte Cristo, 1934. Based on the strength of his performance, he was offered the role of Captain Blood, 1935. I can maybe see that casting. Donitz didn't like life in Hollywood and continued to avoid roles that forced him outside of Britain. Alfred Hitchcock went to England to shoot The 39 Steps in 1935 with Donnett. Donnett was amazing in this movie as a gentle man caught up in a spy ring. Donnett went back to Hollywood to make the popular film The Citadel, 1938. Donnett made the brave choice to stay in England during World War II, unlike many European actors that took the safer choice of Hollywood. During the war, he did a lot of theater and only made four films. After the war, he made another six pictures with his final film being the end of The Sixth Happiness, 1958. By this point, an oxygen bottle was kept on stage as a result of his chronic asthma. Donnett died at the age of 53 in 1958. He left us only 20 films. Weakened by his asthma, the cause of death was a large tumor. The last line he spoke in a film before he died was, We shall not see each other again, I think. Farewell. Greer Garson played the role of Catherine. Garson was born in 1904 in London. I knew very little about this actress prior to researching for this role. She was a huge star during the war years, but kind of tapered off after that. She was nominated for seven Oscars and won Best Actress for Mrs. Miniver, 1942. Garson attended university with the intention of becoming a teacher, but was derailed by the acting bug. She began acting in local productions and by 1932, she was doing stage work professionally. Louis B. Mayer discovered her in London and gave her an MGM contract. Her first film was Goodbye, Mr. Chips, 1939. This was followed by a string of solid movies such as When Ladies Meet, 1941, Blossoms in the Dust, 41, Mrs. Miniver, 1942, Madame Curie, 1943, Mrs. Parkington, 1944, The Valley of Decision, 1945, an Adventure with Clark Gable, 1945. In 1951, Garson became a U.S. citizen. By the mid-50s, her career power was gone. She did bits and pieces with her last film being Walt Disney's The Happiest Millionaire, 1967. She died in Dallas, Texas in 1996 at the age of 91. Terry Kilburn was a child actor that did a little work as an adult. In Goodbye, Mr. Chips, he played generations of the same family. John Colley, Peter Colley I, Peter Colley II, and Peter Colley III. Kilburn was born in London in 1926. He is probably best remembered for two movies and the lines he delivered in each one. In A Christmas Carol, 1938, he played the role of Tiny Tim and, of course, delivered the line, God bless us, everyone. And in today's film, he dropped the line, Goodbye, Mr. Chips. John Mills was a grown-up version of Peter Colley II. Born in England in 1908, Mills grew up to be a beloved movie star. He had over 120 acting credits when he stopped acting. Determined to be an actor from an early age, he went directly into performing after high school. He began with small film roles before the war, 
but later developed a career based on strong military roles. However, I remember him best for Swiss Family Robinson in 1960. He was the dad. After an eight-decade career, he died at the age of 97 in 2005. Paul Henry played German master Stoffel. Henry was born to an aristocratic family in Vienna, Austria in 1908. After graduating, he began working for Otto Priminger and studying acting at night. Through a Priminger connection, Henry was given many theater roles. As the war clouds began to gather in Europe, Henry traveled to London in 1935. His first English-speaking role was in Goodbye, Mr. Chips, 1939. After that, they began casting him as a Nazi in such films as Night Train to Munich, 1940. He began working on Broadway to escape this typecasting. He started getting movie roles as a swab guy, like in Now Voyager, 1942, where he famously lit two cigarettes and passed one to Betty Davis. And of course that year, he was the anti-fascist Victor Laszlo, in Casablanca, 1942. After that, he tried his hand at swashbuckling in the Spanish Main, 1945. I couldn't really see it. In the 1950s, he bravely spoke out against McCarthy and the House Un-American Activities Committee. He was blacklisted, but Alfred Hitchcock hired him to direct television shows. Henry died in 1992 of pneumonia. Story. The movie begins on the first day of school, 1928. All of the boys are assembled in the Great Hall, and the masters are present wearing their mortars and robes. It has a very Harry Potter feel to it. The headmaster says that for the first time in 83 years, retired teacher Mr. Chippings will not be able to attend because he is sick. Mr. Chipping runs across the campus, heading for the Great Hall. On the way, he meets a boy that is running late. They are both locked out of the hall. Mr. Chipping does his best to make the boy feel comfortable. I'm Dorset, sir. Duke of Dorset? The Dorset father, he was always late, always late. Once the door is open, the boys all greet him warmly. He meets the new master and gives him some advice on the way back to his lodging. When Mr. Chipping goes inside the house, his housekeeper berates him about how much food the boys eat each year at his tea parties. And a uh, cake, eh? Oh, yes, there's a cake. I wonder how many of them those boys have eaten since you first came to lodge here. Letting them gorge you out of house and home. Last term, 26 ice cakes, 200 rock cakes, 156 bath buns. Enough of your loathsome statistics, woman. Go about your business. Mr. Chipping sits in his chair by the fire and dreams his school years in flashback. At the age of 25, Charles Edward Chipping travels to Brookfield Public School to be a Latin teacher. The year is 1870. The train platform is filled with parents hustling late children and loud caterwauling of the boys. Again, it has a very Harry Potter feel. Chipping tries to console a sad boy on the train who suddenly burst into tears. The other boys think he may have hit the sad youth. The other teachers warn Mr. Chipping to watch out for pranks. The boys try their usual tricks and begin to run around the class wildly and ignore Mr. Chipping. About that time, the headmaster pops in and calls Mr. Chipping to task. He also tries to fire him on his first day. That's a little cold, but Mr. Chipping vows he will do better and becomes a strict disciplinarian. At one point, the school loses a cricket match to their rivals because Mr. Chipping keeps the entire class after school. He bends the boys to his will, but they loathe him. As the years pass, he becomes a master but does not have a bond with any of his students. They do a really good job in the movie of showing the years passing by changing clothing styles on the boys at first day check-in. At the end of one year, a housemaster job comes open, and Mr. Chipping expects to get it because he is senior. However, the headmaster gives the job to another teacher, intimating that Mr. Chipping does not really like students. To cheer him up, the German master, Max Stoffel, Paul Henry, invites Mr. Chipping to a walking tour of Austria. On the trip, Mr. Chipping is mountain climbing when a thick fog moves in. He hears a female voice call out from above, and he bravely climbs to find Kathy Ellis, Greer Garson, safe on a ledge. She is a modern woman on a cycling trip with her friend Flora, and is about half the age of Mr. Chipping. They spend the night talking, sharing food, and trying to stay warm. They are both taken with each other. 
He likes that she is young and full of life, and she likes that he is old-fashioned and kind. As soon as the fog clears, a rescue party that includes Stoffel and Flora head up the mountain. The rescue party meets the couple coming down the mountain. Mr. Chipping is the big hero, but leaves the party to be alone because he is so shy. In the morning, the two women are gone by the time the men leave. They wander around the country, and Mr. Chipping is longing to see the woman he has already fallen in love with. As the trip nears its end, the pair take a boat to Vienna. Unbeknownst to them, the women are also on the boat. Mr. Chipping notes that the Blue Danube only appears blue to those in love. Why do they call it the Blue Danube? It looks brown to me. There's a legend, you know. Yes, the Danube is only blue to the eyes of, uh, well, to people in love, you know. How so? You surprise me. The Danube doesn't by any chance look blue to you, does it? What do you mean? What nonsense. You, you do talk most infernal about some kind of real estate. On the other part of the boat, Kathy comments how blue the water looks. They meet on the gangplank and everyone is overjoyed, except an old German trying to get off the boat. On the last night of the trip, Mr. Chipping and Kathy sit and talk while Stoffel and Flora dance the night away. Finally, Kathy tells Mr. Chipping that they must dance. He shyly goes forward and they dance to the Blue Danube Waltz. Of course, this is foreshadowing their true love. In the morning, they kiss at the train, and Mr. Chipping is thunderstruck. As Kathy leaves on the train, Mr. Chipping is afraid he will never see her again, but Stoffel explains that he and Miss Flora have already picked a chapel for the wedding, and Stoffel is to be the best man. All the stodgy old masters talk about how homely Mr. Chipping's wife must be, but as soon as they meet her, they are all taken in by her charm. I will take a minute to remark on how beautiful Greer Garson looked in this film. They must have had her lit perfectly in every scene. At this point, she renames him Chips. She begins entertaining the boys with cake and tea and slowly shows Mr. Chips how to love his work. She also tells him that one day he will be the headmaster of Brookfield. Their marriage is very short because Kathy dies in childbirth early in the marriage. Mr. Chip throws himself into teaching and the years tick by. With the passing of time, he teaches generations of families. In 1909, a new headmaster takes over and tries to force Mr. Chips to retire. He goes to the Board of Governors, most of whom he has taught, and they tell him he can continue until he is 100 if he wants to and is free to pronounce a dead language any way he pleases, pronouncing Cicero as Cicero and not Cicero. Around this time, Mr. Chip breaks up a fight between a student and a townie, or as we might call them now, cutters. In 1914, Chips finally retires at the age of 69 never making it to headmaster. Shortly thereafter, he is asked to come back as all the younger teachers are heading to fight in World War II. Chips is happy that his wife's faith in him has proven correct, but it is a sad time as teachers are killed and young men head off to war. At the reading of the honor roll, he sadly reports former German master Max Stoffel was killed leading a Saxon regiment against the English. Peter Cully II, John Mills, drops by to ask Mr. Chips to check in on his wife and baby as he heads off to the war. He is the boy that had a fight, and his driver is the boy he fought with, now joining forces to fight the Germans. Of course, the Brookfield boy is the officer, and the townie is an enlisted man. Collie is killed shortly thereafter. It seems that Chips only visited once. One night, the boys are all in the lower hall as a bombing raid from a German blimp takes place. He has a boy translate from Julius Caesar's commentary on the Gaelic Wars, and as the bombs fall, the passage talks of the belligerent nature of the Germans. This was kind of fighting. Quo se Germani exercurant, in which the Germans busied themselves. <laughs> These dead languages do come to life sometimes, don't they? <laughs> The first Zeppelin raid on London took place on September 8, 1915, and wiped out the Dolphin Tavern. That's one way to make the English mad. Finally, the war ends and Chips retires again in 1918. We have now made it back to the night he was locked out of the Great Hall in 1933. As a prank, older boys send a first-year student to knock on Mr. Chips' door. When Chips sees what is happening, he invites the boy in for tea, cake, and cookies. The boy turns out to be Peter Colley III. 
The boy leaves with the line, Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Bye, Mr. Chips. Bye, Mr. Chips. Chips hears the voices of his life and falls ill. As he lays in his deathbed, he hears the professors talking about his life. He says, I thought I heard you say it was a pity. Pity? I never had children. But you're wrong. I have. Thousands of them. Thousands of them. As he dies, a parade of boys from all times go by in silhouette, representing his life's work. Then Peter the Third gives another goodbye, Mr. Chips. I cry. World famous short summary? Man takes way too long to get good at his job. If you've enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends. And if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show notes to my site. Beware the Moors.